Hi, welcome to 90% Knitting. This is episode 258, and I'm Lisa, your host. I am Fiber Nymph on Ravelry. There's a Fiber Nymph account on Instagram, as well as a Fiber Nymph Dye Works account on Instagram, where you can follow me. Um, there's a 90% Knitting group on Ravelry, which is where I'll be posting the show notes. There's a Fiber Nymph Dye Works group on Ravelry, um, where you can go for information regarding things with my yarn business. And lastly, there is a Fiber Nymph Dye Works page on Facebook, which has a little bit of everything about the podcast and the yarn business and where I'm vending, things like that. So, <laughs> um, hi, how are you? Today is Friday. Is it Friday? It's Friday. I have Thursday written on my show notes, but I have the date right. It's September 29th, but it's actually Friday. Um, it's cold. <laughs> we woke up today and it was 43 degrees and it's only 52 and I'm out in the porch room because as much as I would love to be sitting outside today, it's sunny as you can see, um, but it's breezy and again, 52 degrees. I'm not up for that. <laughs> so we're inside. However, I did not bother turning the heat on out here. There's like a separate baseboard heater out in this room, which is really nice in the winter because, you know, it can be frigid out here, but that heater like heats things up super quick. So that's lovely, but I thought, oh, I don't need to turn the heater on. Now I'm really wishing I turned the heater on. <laughs> but um, I have a shawl behind me if I really, really need to curl up. But you know what? The fact that the sun is coming in right here, while that might be a lighting issue as we progress, it's going to keep me warm because that sunbeam feels really, really good. So <laughs> we'll just go with that. How are you this week? Um, I'm coming to you a little later in the week than I usually do. It's been a very busy week. Um, I am deep in um, prep mode for, <laughs> I've actually got a lot going on right now. We've got the final shipment of the barber pole um, spinning, the fiber club shipping out. That'll be going out tomorrow. So I've been working on that. Um, I've got a show coming up in October, so I'm working on that. And we've got the holiday countdown mini collections um, that I am working like gangbusters on to get ready for you to ship by November 1st. So that's pretty much what I'm going to be eating, sleeping, and breathing for the next month, um, is especially those mini collections and getting ready for my show. Hoping to throw in a shop update in there because, you know, I've got to pay the bills. Um, but yeah, it's going to be interesting. <laughs> I told Bill, I said, I was, I was winding mini balls this morning at breakfast <laughs> and he's just looking at me. I'm like, yeah, you're going to see me doing this all month long because <laughs> I have to wind like 1,090 some mini balls for those little, for those countdown sets. I cannot wait to ship these out to you guys though. I have been having so much fun dyeing up the yarn for those. It's been, it's been great. And I love making the mini balls. I actually find that very meditative to wind mini balls, like the 10 gram mini balls. I just sit there, do it. It's like, it's very relaxing actually. It's just a lot of fun to do. Um, but anyway, that's what's going on with me this week. Um, that and what else happened this week? It was my birthday this week on Wednesday. It was fairly anticlimactic to tell you the truth. Um, Bill was out of town. He didn't get home till later that night. Um, my son and I went, took me out. He took me out to dinner the night before, so that was kind of nice. Um, but yeah, other than that, I pretty much just worked on my birthday, um, yarn work and work at my house because I was at my house on that that day. So, you know, when you're my age, <laughs> I was turning fifty one, not fifteen. When you're fifteen, it's a little more exciting. Fifty one, eh, not so much. But you know happy to be alive. <laughs> so yeah, I guess that's everything. I'll tell you more later in 10%, but that was my week. Um, all that to say, actually, though, it's a good introduction to the fact that um, because I was super busy with dying and dying and dying and things like related to dying and prepping for dying and all that good stuff, I didn't have a whole lot of knitting time. And that was one of the reasons I held off on recording because it's like, I don't have a whole lot to show you, um, but I am gonna show you what I have worked on because I also have a conundrum I'll throw out there. You guys can give me your opinions on. Um, but let's start with um, my hero 
cardigan, which I have still not finished the second sleeve, although I'm quite close. So here's the sleeve. It really does not look too much different. Whoops, sorry, I dropped the ball. Didn't doesn't look too much different than it did the last time. You saw it. Um, it's very close to being done though. It's probably about up to here. And like, this is all I have left of the ball that I was using. And I know with the first sleeve, I did have to go into a second ball. So I'm almost done with the first one. I have not counted the stitches to see how many stitches I've got on here yet. I kind of gave up on keeping track of my increases. I just know I'm increasing every fifth round. So I'm just doing that. Um, and then eventually I'll count. And once I get to the right number of stitches, I'll stop and I'll knit straight for the rest of the, the time. Um, I was trying to count last night. I was actually working on this after dinner a little bit. And every time I tried to count, Bill started talking to me. And it wasn't a big deal. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm going to just not bother trying to count these anymore. So, um, yeah, I'm back to working on this a little bit. It, obviously, it's cooled off. Like, the last couple of weeks have been unseasonably hot. Matter of fact, earlier this week, it was still ridiculously hot. I want to say it went up into the 90s one day, like the low 90s. That's crazy for the end of September. So now that it's back into a more seasonable, comfortable temperature range for this time of year, I'm more inclined to want to be working with Icelandic wool. <laughs> so that is the Hero Sweater. Well, it's one of the sleeves for the Hero Sweater um, by Julia Farwell Clay. And I'm using Let Lopi which is Icelandic wool. It's a singles yarn, um, very toothy, but um, I'm looking forward to having that sweater done. And like I said, once I get to the end of this sleeve and I can join it to the body, then the rest of it's just the color work yoke and I'm done. I say that as if I'm gonna fly through that color work yoke, although I think I will be moving at it pretty well just because that's gonna be the fun part, all those fun colors, heck yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, moving on. What else did I work on? I worked a little bit on my Rudbeckia shawl. This is the shawl that I was really hoping to have done by my show in October. I'm not sure I'm going to get it done, though. It would be a good sh sample, but I have my um, color affection as a good sample, too, frankly, so I'm not too, too concerned. But here's my Rudbeckia. When you saw it last week, um, I was on the um, second linen section, which is this pink section. Um, I think I still had like another repeat of that to do. So I finished the linen part and then I did my six rows of stockinette. So now I'm back to, I will be doing garter ridges um, with the black and the, the pink again. I just didn't have a whole lot of time to work on it, but I made a little bit of progress. So actually I believe now I do garter ridges and then I think there's two more sections of this eyelet stuff that I started with here. Um, and then the bind off or the edging. I actually not, I don't remember what the edging is on this sweater. Hmm. Let me look. <laughs> yeah, there's two more sections of, okay, here's the picture. So here's what it'll look like. So I will have these two of these on here. It's the purple. I have those with garter ridges between them. And then it looks like that's just, it looks like it's a garter ridge border at the end. So that really won't take very long. If I just spend some time on it, <laughs> that seems to be key, doesn't it? To finishing things. If you have time to spend on it, things get done. Um, but I'm happy with it. It's, it's going to be a pretty shawl once it's done. Um, it's by Anna Sylvester. She wrote the pattern, um, and I'm using my Bounce yarn in soft black and pink Cadillac. So it's coming along, just not very quickly. Um, I did make progress on my son's sock. Still on the first sock. This is actually probably what got the most attention this week. So I'm down to here. Now, Actually, I guess I have two conundrums because I've got one on here, too. Um, the size I'm much happier with, as I said last week. I, I ripped it out and went down to 64 stitches since it's this Patton's Croy FX. It's much more sport weight than fingering weight. However, this may still end up being a no-go because these are only 50-gram balls of sport weight. 
my son has very large feet. And I'm realizing, I usually make him pretty tall um, cuffs on his socks. So I'm thinking two balls of this, which is what I have, is not going to be enough to do tall cuffs and the foot and heels and all that stuff. So I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to do. My thought was to just stop here because I think I'm at about five inches. I keep dropping everything. Um, I'm at about five inches, so I thought I could stop here, do my heel flap and gusset, and then knit out the foot. I'm really not optimistic. I have not weighed this, but if this is already at 25 grams, which I have the feeling it may be, there is no way I'm going to get all the rest of that sock out of this ball. So my options would be see if I could find a third ball of this yarn, which I'm probably, I probably can, but it probably would not be the same dye lot. I don't know how goofy that would make the sock. I could use the third ball to do like an afterthought heel and the toes. Um, or I could just use a contrasting color for the afterthought heels and toes. However, um, my fingering weight would be too light to work with this yarn. And I think my sport weight might be too heavy to work with this yarn. So that would leave me having to see if I can find another Patton's Croy. Do they do just semi-solid colors? I don't even know um, that I could put with this. I don't know. I feel like this yarn is cursed <laughs> because this is now the third time I've cast on with this yarn for socks for my son. And I've run into an issue every single time. I don't know. <sighs> I'm kind of just too tired to really even think about it much. I keep knitting on it just because it's a nice plain vanilla sock to knit on. But honestly, it's like, I don't think this is going to work. <laughs> At least not for the purpose that I want it for. I mean, I could keep knitting it and knit it for myself, but I don't need any more socks right this second. And I could make them for Bill, but Bill likes ribbed socks and this is stockinette. Plus they're way too big for him. He's got pretty slender legs. Um, <laughs> I was going to say four legs. <laughs> Those are your arms. Forearms, um, calves, <laughs> like his lower legs. Gosh, words. Um, so yeah, those would not work for him. So I don't know. I have to think about it. But you know, I'm really like, my hope is dwindling at this point that I'm going to get any of these things done that I was planning to do for Christmas, quite frankly. I don't know. We'll see. I probably sound under-enthused about whether I even care if I get them done. And honestly, right now I am a little bit. I just like, oh my gosh, I feel like I am paddling upstream with these projects and um, with those socks in particular. I just, I don't know. Do you ever get that way? Like you've tried to do a project and you've had to do it multiple times and every time you think you've got it, something is like, ah, oh, that's not going to work, you know? I don't know. So tell me, what, what would you do with these socks? Would you, you know, use a different yarn, try to find another ball of the same yarn? Um, would you burn it? <laughs> I mean, it's wool. It's not going to burn very well. And nobody wants to smell smoldering wool. So let me know. Let me know what you think I should do with those. I'm open to suggestions. Um... Last project that I worked on this week, which is also probably going to get ripped out, to tell you the truth. And actually, you know what, now that I think about it, I may not have worked on this at all this week because I realized I might rip it out. Um, it's the Christmas socks that I cast on for myself using the Regia Arnie and Carlos number 3760, I believe. Um, I'm not liking it. <laughs> I love the red, like this burnt orange red, and I love this tealish bluish green however as I'm knitting it it just looks super dark to me and even though there is a little bit of white like right here mixed in with that red you can see the white but like surrounding all of this this is gray and it's a much darker gray than I was expecting it to be I, I got on Ravelry again this morning actually to look at other finished pairs of these socks and 
Almost every single person's finished pair of socks in this colorway looks much lighter. Like this gray almost looks white. And if it's not white, it's like a much lighter gray than it is in this skein. At least that's how it's looking to me on the, on the computer. Um, I don't know. But like I'm even thinking about when I've seen people show this colorway knit up on their podcasts, it always looked lighter. And I'm just not liking it with this dark gray. I don't know. It's just not singing to me. Otherwise, I like it. I love Regia yarn. It's a great yarn to work with. I did the three by one rib, which is something I don't always do. And I really kind of like that. I don't know if Bill would like this yarn or not. He might. But again, I'm doing a stockinette sock and he prefers ribbed socks. So I suppose I could always rip back to the ribbing and then continue it down in the three by one rib for him if I wanted to make him socks for Christmas, which hadn't planned to, but I guess I could. I don't know if he'd like this colorway or not. He likes red, so he might. I don't know. I'm, I'm disgruntled over this. Um, because it's not turning out to be what I thought it was going to be. And even looking at it in the ball, I mean, looking at it in the ball, it actually does look lighter to me than the way it's knitting up. So I don't know. Muffin's sitting over here in her bed digging. <laughs> she does this. I don't know if you can hear her or not. Anyway, um, yeah, not really loving these socks. I'm thinking, oh, and I did not bring it in with me. I have a ball of West Yorkshire spinners. They're four ply in their Christmas colorway, which is called Hollyberry. And it is a red and a green and another color, maybe white and a black stripe and self-patterning kind of yarn. That one I've seen knit up a million times too. And I have that ball and that definitely looks like the colors are true. So I'm thinking if I want to make myself Christmas socks, I may do it out of that. Although at this point in time, I'm busy enough that I really have no business casting on anything new for myself. I should just work on what I already have on the needles. I really don't need any more socks. I've got so many hand knit socks for myself. I mean, especially considering all those ones that I finished over the summer during Stash Dash. I mean, I've, I've got plenty of socks. I just love knitting socks. That's the thing. I love to knit socks. Even though I did kind of get burned up, out on them while I was doing them during Stash Dash. I feel like that has passed now, though, because I, had, I took a break from them, and now I, I kind of want to be knitting socks again. But I've got all kinds of other things to knit. I've not worked at all on that blanket that I'm making for my son for Christmas or his birthday, whichever it ends up. So, I mean, I could easily focus on that, but that is not a portable project. Like, socks, socks are portable. That's why I love them so much. So I don't know. And I want to get my sweater done. And I need to figure out what I'm doing with these socks for my other son. And I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I'm hitting this point of knitting malaise or ennui, maybe. I want to be knitting. I'm just not really jazzed about anything that I'm knitting right now. I hate when that happens because that's usually when I start casting things on willy-nilly. And that is not something I need to be doing right now. I just don't. <laughs> so I don't know, we'll see. I should work on the shawl, I should work on the sweater and just focus on those. Because again, I'm not gonna have a whole lot of knitting time in October, I don't think. Um, I don't know, <laughs> we'll see. But anyway, those are the only projects that I worked on this week. So feel free to give me your feedback on those two sock projects that I'm having my issues with. Or, you know, feel free to give me your opinion on anything else knitting wise. I love hearing your opinions. You guys sometimes have such wonderful ideas when I just sort I feel like I'm rambling a lot this episode about my knitting projects. And I probably am. Um, and that's a reflection of the fact that I'm just sort of like in this middle ground with everything like this no man's land on my knitting it's like I want to be knitting them but I'm not knitting them and I don't have time but when I do have time I'm not eh, you know I don't know so <laughs> aren't you glad I recorded today yes I know 
Oh my goodness. Let's move on. Let's go on to the year in the life of a knitter. Um, I realized if I would have waited like two more days to record, I could have taken care of the September prizes and the third quarter prizes, the summer quarter prizes, but um, I did not want to wait anymore because see, the problem is when I wait, like I could have waited till next week and just record because clearly I don't have a ton of knitting content to give you this week. Um, the problem is if I wait too long, then I end up with way too much stuff and that's when we have the ridiculously long but I just record today with what I do have to talk about. I actually have a book review I'm going to do in a little bit. So hang on for that because that's actually very cool. Um, but yeah, I will I will do the prize um, announcements next week. I will say that because I'm planning to do a shop update next Friday and because I'll have these prize um, announcements to make next week as well, I'm probably going to record again before a week is even out. Um, I can tell you I probably won't have a ton of knitting content, but if you're interested in who won the prizes for the knit along, um, I'll also have the third quarter Fiber Nymph Dye Works prize to announce next week. Um, if, you, if you're into any of that, or if you would like to see what's going to be in the shop update next Friday, then next week's episode will probably be cool for you. I just can't promise that there's going to be a whole lot of knitting content unless I really... Um, give up sleep or um, really start cooking on one of these projects. We'll see. There, there'll be some. I mean, I'm always knitting something. I'm just afraid it may not be very exciting for you if I show you like another inch of gray sleeve and that's like the culmination of my week's knitting or my five days knitting or whatever. Um, but anyway, all that to say is today is the 29th, tomorrow is September 30th, so tomorrow is the last day to get in any of your final chatter for the um, summer quarter and for the month of September, as well as um, if you're participating in the September challenge um, for the knit along, which is shortcuts, um, tomorrow is your last day to get those posted. Oh my gosh, I am really cold. I'm going to wrap this around me. <laughs> Sorry. I'm freezing. I like feel chills coming through. Okay. Um, anyway, yeah, you have till tomorrow, the end of tomorrow, your time. I'll close the thread sometime on Sunday, probably. Um, and I will open the fall, the autumn quarter thread um, on Sunday as well. So let me talk about that since we're, you already know about September and the summer quarter, which is almost over. Let's talk about the autumn quarter. This is the last quarter of our year-long knit-along, the year in the life of a knitter knit-along, um, which has gone so well. I've really enjoyed it, and you guys have too, and I'm so glad we did this. Um, but we're wrapping it up now with one, one more quarter, three more months, so October, November, December. The themes are going to be slightly, actually a lot different than what they were the first three quarters because the first three quarters were very um, focused on actual um, tangible knitting kind of related things like the different yarn weights we did the first two quarters. The third quarter we did like different techniques, different stitches. This final quarter is very different. The themes for the autumn quarter are going to be organizing and simplifying, learning and challenging ourselves, and change. <laughs> I know. It's all still related to your knitting or your crafting. Um, it's just not specific to actual specific projects. But I don't know about you. At this time of year, I often find myself in like a, you know, an organizing kind of mode. It's something about fall. I know most people spring clean. I find myself organizing in the fall. And honestly, it was funny because as I was typing up the show notes and I was, you know, looking back to get the wording right for what the themes were for this fall, organizing and simplifying. Well, boy, <laughs> I feel like that's all I'm doing lately because, you know, I'm trying to organize my house, get it ready to sell, you know, cleaning out, minimizing things. Oh my gosh, story of my life. So <laughs> I'll be participating in this whether I want to or not, frankly. I want to, but you know what I mean. Um, but I, all that said, um, this is with regard to your knitting stuff, not so much just 
house stuff in general. But this is with your, your crafting. So um, again, the themes, organizing and simplifying, learning and challenging ourselves and change. Um, the October focus is going to be cleaning out and organizing your stash. So I would just challenge you. Well, that's actually the focus. That's not, I'm sorry, did I say challenge? That's not the October challenge. The October focus is cleaning out and organizing your stash. So I would, I would offer you the challenge um, to, you know, maybe work on that if you need to. I know I always feel like I need to organize my stash, which was really nice since I just brought most of my stash up here to the mountain house not long ago. I, that was kind of built in organization. Um, it's still not 100% because I don't have the space to do it 100%. <laughs> it just means I have way too much stash. But um, it's much better than it was when it was at my house. And it gave me the chance to go through things and purge some stuff. So that's been super good. Um, yeah, so that's our October focus. The October challenge is going to be craft with deep stash. This is something I love to do. I always feel an extra sense of accomplishment when I have been able to knit with yarn that I have had for 10 years. <laughs> now, excuse me, obviously deep stash, my hands are so cold I can't even go like this right. Um, deep stash is pretty subjective because if you've been knitting for 20 years, you might have yarn that you bought 20 years ago or was given to you. If you've only been knitting for a year, I mean, deep stash to you might be something that you bought eight months ago, okay? So we're using the term deep stash sort of loosely here. Um, it's gonna be subjective. Whatever in your stash is like your kind of oldest yarn or your oldest fabric, if you're a sewist and you're gonna, you know, participate in the challenge with sewing, um, you know, go for the oldest stuff you've got laying around. That's what we're after is trying to use up that stuff that's been sitting around. I mean, it doesn't have to be the absolute oldest, but the stuff that is in that realm of, you know, very well aged stash. Um, and that's basically it. The October challenge is to craft using your deep stash, whatever that is for you. Um, and you have to use at least 50 grams of yarn per project or a quarter yard of fabric. Um, per project um, if you're doing something sewing wise. So there you go, go have at it. I will put the October challenge thread up on Sunday as well. And um, I hope you can get some of that old stash moved out. I, I absolutely adore moving old stash out into projects, usable projects, you know? I find like a lot of my old stash, when I think back on it, I've got a lot of stuff that I bought when I worked at the yarn shop and I was a fairly new knitter then. And so everything had potential. It's like, oh, I can make this, I can make this, you know? And by the time I really got into making the kind of things I thought I was gonna make with that, I realized that's not the yarn that I would wanna make that out of. And so I still have a lot of that. Um, I may actually add a de-stashing component to the challenge. Let me think about that. Watch the thread. If I add that, I will let you know. <laughs> or maybe I'll hang on to that for another time. But anyway, de-stashing is always good too. I've actually got a whole bunch of stuff that I need to put up on Ravelry for de-stash, um, like old sweater lots that I know I will not use. It's still beautiful yarn, like it's good yarn. It's just not yarn that I would choose to use at this point. So um, yeah, that always feels really good to get old stash out of the house or at least knit up, even if it's you know, not out of the house, it might be, you know, a hat. That's, that's what I started to say. I find a lot of my, um, my deep stash is excellent for doing like charity hats. Um, I have a good bit of um, like acrylic wool blend yarn that is good for that. So, you know, maybe you do too. Okay, so that is the autumn quarter for the knit along. Hopefully you guys will still stick around with me for one more quarter of our knit along. Um, and next week, again, we will wrap up the summer quarter with the prizes. Okay, I have a book review for you this week. I don't do book reviews on the podcast very often. Um, 
But I was contacted by um, the publishers for this book. It's called Seed Stitch Beyond Knit One Pearl One by Rosemary Drysdale. And it's by Sixth and Spring Books. And I was contacted by a member of their staff asking if I would be interested in reviewing this book. Um, and I said, yes, I would love to have a copy of this book to review because I love seed stitch. I'm one of those weird people who absolutely adores knitting seed stitch. Um, and maybe that's not the best intro <laughs> for a book review. I'm one of those weird people who likes this kind of stuff. No, I mean that in the way that some people really dislike needing to purl, you know, so they do as little ribbing as they can possibly do. They don't like to knit stockinette stitch flat. Um, but I don't mind it. I like purling. And the thing I love about seed stitch is it's a nice texture, but it's a very soft, subtle texture. I mean, you can make it look bulkier, you know, like double seed stitch and stuff like moss stitch. There's a differentiation there. Um, but they're basically a similar stitch. Um, it can be very bulky, but in general, just doing the knit one, purl one seed stitch is very, I find it a very delicate look, a very delicate texture. And if you have looked at any of the patterns that I have designed that are on Ravelry, a lot of them incorporate seed stitch. Um, I just, I find it very, very pleasing. So whenever I was offered a chance to review this book that was all about seed stitch, I'm like, heck yeah, I want to review that. So let me just, I'm going to walk you through this book. And actually, I'm going to say first, this on the cover, I originally thought that this was one big cowl with all that on it. It's not, it's three different cows. But it would be really cool if it was actually just one cowl, I think. Um, anyway, the book starts out with, um, you know, the same thing a lot of books are out, your, your introduction, talking about, you know, a little bit of knitting history as it relates to knit and purl stitches, which was kind of interesting. And then she's got an in, a section in here about the anatomy of seed stitch, um, which I thought was also very interesting because you can do it in different ways. And she talks about how to do increases and stuff in seed stitch and decreases. Um, and then, I mean, here's a really good example of what I was trying to say. Like, you know, this is seed stitch all knit at different gauges. And even at this big, dense, you know, yarn, this larger gauge, I, mean, I just think it's a very, it's a very pleasing texture to me. I don't, I don't know what it is about it. It just very much appeals to me. Okay, the interesting thing I found about this book is it talks about seed stitch, but also doing color work with seed stitch. And that is not something that I have done before. Um, but she goes into a lot of that. And a lot of the projects that are in here are color work. So that was different. Um, okay, so here you have seed stitch. There's um, this section is called the swatch gallery. And this is actually very, very cool. I forget how many... Um, I did not take notes as I looked through this book, <laughs> but there are um, dozens of swatches in here for different um, seed stitch stitches, basically. But here's your basic seed stitch, and then this is moss stitch. Um, the two terms tend to sometimes be interchangeable. I believe in the UK, what we call seed stitch is actually what they call moss stitch, but what we call moss stitch is more of like a a modified seed stitch, if that makes sense. Um, and then there's double moss stitch, um, which she's got in here too. But then she's just, a lot of these are in single colors. So here, I like this one, that's the chevron seed stitch. Um, but then as you go, ooh, this one's cool too. These are cables with seed stitch and you know, that's really cool because, you know, ordinarily whenever you do cables, you're doing it on a bed of purl stitches, um, reverse stockinette, but doing cables on the seed stitch bed actually looks pretty neat. Again, it's just a little extra texture. So if you want something, I mean, I think that would be beautiful for a nice big, 
like comfy um, sweater like with a lot of cables, a very dense sweater. Um, then she jumps into the color work seed stitch patterns. So there's a lot in here and some of them look very, very cool. I just, I would not think to do color work with seed stitch. I don't know why, but I had never thought of doing it before, but I think it looks pretty neat. And again, here's chevrons. You guys know how much I love my chevrons. <laughs> so anyway, there's a huge swatch section in here, which is really neat. And then we get to the end of the swatch section. You know, the other thing, let me mention just real quick. Um, when you think about doing two colors, like stranded knitting, I mean, stranded knitting tends to get a little bit bulky just because you're working with two strands of yarn the whole way across. And so that gives it extra squish. Um, and then seed stitch adds texture to that. So you would think, wow, that would be really, really bulky. But I mean, even looking at these, which are just like, you know, two rows of um, color uh, stranded seed stitch with I don't know that it's called stranded. It's striped seed stitch is what they're calling it. But you're working with two colors. Um, but in this case, you're working with a different color in each row as opposed to the color work one where you're, you know, actually doing stranded stuff. Um, it looks like it would be bulky, but it's not. And again, I guess maybe on this case, it is just because you're using a single color per row. Now here, these, you're doing stranding and so they do look a little bit denser, but again, they're very squishy. And if you didn't want it to be quite as dense, you could knit it at a larger gauge. And that would give you more drape. So, Okay, so we've got the swatch gallery. And the, oh, she's actually got some three color in here as well. And I think this top one is so pretty. I think I love those colors more than anything, but I just think it looks very pretty because once you get three colors going in there, and they are all alternating. I mean, it just looks like like pebbles, like a whole swath of pebbles or something. I don't know. I think it's very pretty. And then she's also got some lace, seed stitch with lace in it. So. Okay, so let me get through the rest of the swatch gallery here. And then we've got patterns. Um, I'm not sure exactly how many patterns are in here, but there's some very pretty patterns in here. Um, I'm gonna show you some of my favorites as we go. This one is just a very simple moss stitch cowl, but again, it just looks so cozy. I would, I would love, like if you knit that out of like a nice squishy yarn, oh my goodness. I love that texture and I just think it looks very pretty. Um, and then she got she does have a lot of two color patterns in here. These wristers are one of them, and I think they're very pretty. And they're done with fingering weight yarn, I believe. Uh, oh no, that's DK weight. I'm sorry. Um, felt Rowan felted tweed DK, um, but it doesn't look bulky. Again, that would always that would be my concern with doing seed stitch with two colors that it would be bulky, but it really does not look bulky. I think this pillow, again with the chevrons. See, I just love chevrons, but I love this pillow. Um, and the, the chevrons, the blue chevrons are done in seed stitch, and then the white chevrons are done in stockinette. So I think that's very cool. I think having them balanced like that cuts down on any excess bulkiness that you might not want. Okay, let's see. I love this bag. Um, here the striping is going vertically instead of horizontally. So I think that's pretty cool. Although you can do it the other way. Oh, maybe one way, hmm. Oh, one side of the bag is vertical, one side is horizontal. That's what it is. Because <laughs> it's called the two-way striped bag. Um, so the back of the bag is, I'm trying not to show you charts, um, it stripes the other way. So there you go. But that's just like a really nice clean design, you know. Um, there's another cowl, which again, these were all the ones that were on like the front of the book all stacked up together. So that's another two color cowl. Um, 
I think this is so cute, but I think part of it is the the big fluffy uh, pom pom on there. But that's really pretty. It's the diamond check hat. Oh my goodness, this looks amazing, as in really super squishy. Um, it was knit with Big Montana, which is a Taki Stacy Charles yarn. It's that super gigantic yarn that you're knitting on US 19s. <laughs> but check it out, that, that throw. Doesn't that just look like something that would be awesome to curl up under? Oh my goodness. There's a V-neck um, short sleeve pullover. I can't say that this is something that really appeals to me, but I think the design is kind of cool. I would not wear it just because it's very chunky and I don't need any extra help with the chunkiness. Um, but if you like that kind of style, I think doing that all over seed stitch, again, it's just, it's a nice texture and it, it makes something very squishy, you know, that I think would be super comfy. There's more pillows in here. Um, there's this scarf, this cowl that is very interesting. It's called the open squares cowl. Um, that has like this negative space thing going on in it. But the, the knitting part is actually seed stitch and then you've got those open spaces, which I'm gonna assume are uh, um, accomplished by doing some binding off and everything. So I don't know, it's just, that's a very unique design. And then there's some scarves and then there's another bag. I really like this bag. It's a slip stitch bag, um, which also has, you know, the seed stitch in that orangey color. I think that's super pretty. Actually, the, there's gray seed stitch in here too, but the, the slip stitches are in the gray. So, and then there's a poncho. You know, I keep talking about, I will have all these things I want to cast on. I am dying to make a poncho. I don't know why I've never, well, actually I take that back. I did make a poncho for one of my nieces one time, a long time ago. Uh, I've never made myself a poncho though. I think this one's beautiful. Isn't that pretty? And it's got seed stitch motifs all through it. And I love that big ribbed cowl neck on there. It's just beautiful. Then there's a baby blanket and some more hats. Um, and oh, there's a couple of cute little baby cardigans. Those are really cute. So anyway, I know I'm just kind of zipping through this pretty quickly, but honestly, it's a very cool book. I like the book. I like, um, I love the stitch gallery because if you want to just kind of incorporate different seed stitch motifs into your own knitting without using a pattern, that would be perfect. And obviously there's tons of patterns in here and several of them I could see myself knitting <laughs> when I have time to knit. Um, no, seriously. And plus there's a lot of them that are small enough that they would make great gift ideas. So anyway, again, this book is by Rosemary Drysdale and it's called Seed Stitch Beyond Knit One, Pearl One. Um, and they, the publisher was kind enough to offer a copy of this as a giveaway as well. So I'm going to start a thread in the 90% Knitting Group on Ravelry. And um, if you would like to enter to win a free copy of this book, you can follow whatever the prompt is that I will end up putting in there. Just read the thread and you'll know what to do. And you can enter once and I will leave this drawing up. Um, I'll leave it up for two podcasts. Um, since we're going to have a whole bunch of other drawings next week, I'll leave it up to the podcast after that. And then I'll announce the winner um, and they will send you the book directly. So. Alrighty, so that was my book review. <laughs> One of my rare, rare book reviews. Um, I would tell you what the name of this is, but I honestly can't remember. I knit it a long time ago. It's in my project page if you want. I would take the time to look now, but nobody needs me to sit here and do that. Um, it's nice and warm though. It's Entrelac. It's like one of the only Entrelac projects I ever did. And I love the yarn. I can't remember what the yarn was either. Um, but I actually, what I loved a lot about it was this edging. So it's got this like spider web almost dropped stitch edging. I just thought it was so cool. I, I made it a long time ago and then I hardly ever used it. 
And then when I started dating Bill and I was spending a lot of time up here, it was very chilly in the winter. So I brought this up just to wrap up in it and I figured I could leave it here. And it's been here ever since. So, okay. Like you needed to know that. <laughs> Let's move on to 10%. Oh, I lost my show notes again. Let's see, where'd they go? Here they are. All right, so 10%. Um, let me get you up to date on the chipmunk saga. So last time I recorded, the chipmunk was still at large in the house. Um, he has since been caught. Right after I recorded, actually, I did go out to the mail and the small, the tiny have a heart trap that I ordered had come. So I brought it in, I set it up and literally within like a few hours, he was trapped and he was not happy because I think he realized that his free ride on the peanut butter and sunflower seed train was over um, because he'd just kind of been coming and going and eating out of the bigger trap. But yeah, that one caught him. It was very sensitive. It was perfect for a chipmunk. So um, Bill took him and relocated him into the woods across the road from us where hopefully he will stay and not get caught by any other cats. Um, in the meantime, yesterday, <laughs> oh, yesterday morning, we're sitting at the breakfast table and, you know, I get up while Bill's in the shower. He's, you know, he's getting ready for work and I come out and the first thing I do is I feed the cats. So I went about the routine. I fed the cats and after they ate the one who's not usually a very vocal cat, he's standing on the floor in, we have a dry sink in our kitchen that's, you know, just for storage, obviously. We have a normal sink. But anyway, he's kind of standing in front of there, which is where their food usually is. And he's meowing. And I'm like, what is your problem? You just ate. I fed you. You know, I don't know what's wrong. So I didn't think much of it. So anyway, that was odd. But anyway, then like a half hour later, so we're sitting at the kit, at the, break, the table and we're eating breakfast. And Tippy is going berserk. She was under the dry sink just like bouncing around under there. And Bill's like, what is she doing? I said, I don't know. I said, there's cat toys that have gotten pushed under there. I'm sure she's probably just playing with a cat toy. Hmm. Okay, so then a couple minutes later, Muffin walks over to the water dish, which is on a tray in front of the dry sink on the floor. And I thought that was a little odd just because she doesn't usually get up and go to the water dish that early in the morning, she usually eats her breakfast, goes outside and then lays down and takes a nap. Um, but so that was a little strange, but I didn't think much of it, but Tippy's still under there. Then all of a sudden we look over and there's something just plunked on the floor um, over by the steps, kind of between the dry sink and the steps. And I didn't have my contacts in. And so I said, is that a giant lizard? <laughs> And Bill's like, no, it's a chipmunk. And he runs over and he scoops Tippy up and throws her in the in the office and shuts the door. Well, I got up and looked. And this poor thing, that must have been what Tippy was playing with, what it was, what Tippy was playing with under the dry sink. One of the other cats must have brought this little critter in overnight and it had been in there and it was injured. That's the bad part. Um, and so... At least I'm pretty sure it had to have been injured because otherwise I think it would have run when Tippy started playing with it. Its back legs aren't moving, so it clearly has some sort of spinal injury. Um, but anyway, what had happened was Tippy must have picked it up, dumped it in the water dish, which is what got Muffin's attention, and then plunked it on the floor. And since it its back legs aren't working, it was pushed up on its front legs. And that's why at a distance it kind of looked like an iguana to me. <laughs> or some sort of lizard. We don't have those things around here. Um, but anyway, it was soaking wet. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And Bill, I mean, he's like, it's, you know, it's back's broken. He's like, we're going to have to like put it out of its misery. I'm like, no, you can't, you cannot kill this poor thing. And that sounds really heartless. But let me tell you, when you live in the country, you deal with this stuff. Um, I've dealt with this all my life. I remember my dad having to put animals out of their misery because they'd been injured or whatever. And it's not pleasant, but it's part of country life. Um, anyway, but I was not ready to let this poor little guy go. I'm like, no, because I mean, he was very alert and he was like, his upper half worked fine. And Bill's like, he could have internal injuries, but he's like, but if you want to put him in a box and see if, you know, if he comes around, maybe 
it's just a spinal shock or something and his, you know, he might be okay. We'll do that. So we got a box, put him in, put him in the bathroom away from all the cats. And um, I covered him up with a little rag <laughs> thing. So, you know, that was the saga yesterday morning. So all morning, I kept going in and checking on this little critter. And I finally looked at him. I'm like, you know what? You are not a chipmunk. The coloring was not at all like a chipmunk. And even if, because we thought it was like a young chipmunk. And it just, it didn't look right. I thought, you don't look like a chipmunk. Your coloring's off. And he had really big eyes. And his tail was super flat, which even a young chipmunk has a fluffy tail. And then I realized, you look baggy. You look like you've deflated. And I finally realized, you're a flying squirrel. <laughs> I for, Honestly, I didn't even realize we had flying squirrels around here. But I Googled it, and indeed, we do have flying squirrels. One of them was in my bathroom and is still in my bathroom. Um, and so I deduced that this is a southern flying squirrel. The northern flying squirrels are actually endangered, but they're not this far south in Pennsylvania. And his coloring was right, and his size was right. So that's what he is. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do with you, you poor little thing? And so, you know, I, I still don't know what we're going to do. I called a wildlife rehab place that's about a half hour away from here. I called them yesterday, got their voicemail. They're like, this is a really busy time of year for us, so please leave a message and be patient. We'll get back to you. And I never heard back from them yesterday. I told them what I was calling for, that I had an injured animal. Um, so I haven't heard from them. And they're... There's one other place that's sort of, it's closer actually to my house than for here. So I may try calling them. I just don't know what to do. I have no idea what to do for this poor guy. Like I said, he seems fine other than the fact that his spine is clearly injured and he can't move his back legs or fly. <laughs> they glide. They don't really fly. They glide. Um, and, you know, all these websites are like, it's illegal to keep a wild animal as a pet. And it's like, I know that, but what are you supposed to do? And my other hesitation is if he is injured beyond repair, which I think he is, I mean, wildlife rehab places specifically are meant to rehab animals so they can be re-released into the wild. That's their objective. So I don't know what they do with ones that cannot be rehabbed. You know, like, do they euthanize them? I don't know. And I guess if an animal is suffering and in pain, then it makes sense to euthanize them. But I don't know that this guy is. I mean, he's not crying. He's not making any kind of noise, to tell you the truth. I thought that was weird that he did not make any noise at all while Tippy was playing with him. Maybe flying squirrels don't make noise. I don't know. Um, but he, he sleeps and he crawls around a lot just using his front legs. So I'm really reluctant to turn him over to somebody who may end up just euthanizing because he won't ever fly again or he can't use his legs. I mean, I know there's like this boundary between, yes, this is a wild animal and not a pet. I get that. But I would have a very hard time willingly turning over an animal to somebody who's just going to end up killing it because they can't heal it, even though it's not necessarily suffering. Do you know what I mean? Is this just me or am I looking at this completely wrong? I don't know. The bottom line is I don't know what to do. And Bill doesn't really know what to do. You know, we have both in the past, you know, rehabilitated animals on our own and then been able to re-release them or they die. <laughs> That's usually my experience. Mine don't fare well, but a lot of mine are usually in pretty bad shape by the time I've found them. I just, I don't know what to do. And then it's so funny, too, because the, the rehabs, the wildlife rehab website is, if you find an injured animal, put it in a box, but don't feed it. It's like, okay, if you're not going to call me back for over 24 hours, I'm going to feed this animal because he's going to go hungry and then he's going to die. So we did put, like, some seeds and stuff in the box for him and some water. Um, so far, he does not look like he's eaten anything. So I don't know. I don't know what to do with this poor guy. I'm just, I'm going to hang on to him in the box until I either hear from the wildlife people or until he passes on or whatever. I don't know. I don't know what to do. It's very, very troubling. Um, but for right now, I have a flying squirrel in my bathroom <laughs> in a box. Um, and then last night we're eating dinner. I know. Can you believe this? We're eating dinner and all of a sudden I hear Bill say, no. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And here, there's a mouse 
on our kitchen floor and a cat flew down the steps. It was probably Princess. She's the one who drags most of these animals in. But this was a perfectly healthy mouse that she had just picked up and brought in. And so Bill's like, Lisa, go get me something. So he wants a container because the mouse popped down and is on this top step again. They all go to the top step and then they don't know what to do. And so he's trying to keep him from running down the steps until I get him a container. So I grab the first Tupperware container I find, which was round. And <laughs> He's trying to get this Tupperware container to line up with the step so the mouse will go in it. He's like, a round container is not the best thing to use on a step. It can go under the curve. I'm like, oh, okay. So then I hand him a lid, a, like a square lid, thinking he'll be able to scoot him into the container. And he's like, this is not working. Can you please get me a rectangular container? Okay, so I go and I get him like a square container. I hand him that. Well, in the meantime, the mouse had jumped up onto this piece of trim that runs along the wall where our stairs are. And so he's trying to scamper down there. So Bill's using like the lid and the square container and the lid doesn't even go with the square container. <laughs> it's a different size, but he's trying to scoop him into there. So I'm standing there and I'm holding the round container and I had a magazine too, because I figured if we get them in a container, we have to have something to put over top of it. So I've got the round container and a magazine. Well, Bill manages to get the mouse like into the square container, except he jumps out right away and jumps on top of it. And so Bill's got the container with the mouse sitting on top of it. And he's trying to shake him into the round container that I'm holding, except this little mouse is clinging onto the rim with his claws. <laughs> this was a riot. And finally we get him in there and I put the magazine over the top of the round container and we just stood there and laughed. It's like, how many humans and Tupperware containers does it take to catch a tiny little mouse? Apparently a lot. So Bill took him outside, took him across the road, <laughs> released him where hopefully he will find a new home. But it's like, oh my gosh, nature is going crazy here. And I'm sure part of that is the fact that it's this time of year, it's starting to get colder and critters are, you know, they're running around trying to get ready for winter and everything. But unfortunately, that also means our cats are like finding a lot more things to play with. So, oh my goodness. It's been nuts. <laughs> no pun intended, because that's what all these little guys are looking for is nuts. <sighs> anyway, all right. So that was the animal saga, the nature saga for this week. I'll keep you posted <laughs> on the flying squirrel and any other additions we get. Um, let's move on to shop news. <laughs> um, you have until the end of tomorrow to also post your finished objects in the Fiber Nymph Dye Works finished object thread. So anything that you have finished using my yarn or fiber in the months of July, August, or September, Post in there and you will be entered for a $25 gift certificate. And I'll announce that winner next podcast. And I will start the fourth quarter thread as well. So that's an ongoing thing. I do that all the time. I've been doing that for years. Um, and also the Overcome pre-orders. They're still up in the shop, but tomorrow's the last day for those. Um, I do have my um, Pigskin Party exclusive colorway up. Finally, oh my goodness. This took me a while. I had such a hard time getting what I wanted to do to work. And I ended up trying a couple different colorways and this is the one that I finally landed on and that I really love. And I do have the listing up in the shop. It is the exclusive pigskin party colorway for 2017. Um, and I also have the information in that thread over in the Downseller Studio podcast group. Um, and so I really like the pictures I took. I had fun taking the listing pictures for this colorway. And I will try to remember to insert that picture in here so you can see. But here's the yarn. It is called Taco Dip. <laughs> and my, my thought process on this is, what is your favorite thing to eat during halftime? Well, one of the favorite things I love to make um, for like if I go to football parties or anything like that, which I don't do too often anymore, but when I did, I always made taco dip. Everybody wanted the taco dip and there was never any left. Um, so this is taco dip. So it's got segments of the semi-solid taco meat brown. And then we've got the golden chip colored semi-solid areas. And then you've got these 
whiter areas here, which are speckled with all of the yummy toppings that you put on the cream cheese and it's it's not cream. Yes, it's cream cheese and French onion dip mixed together. That's the white part. And then, <laughs> I'm giving you a recipe, by the way. And um, and then the speckles are the orange for the cheese. And then there's greens for the lettuce and reds for the diced tomato. So that is taco dip. It's a variegated, obviously a variegated and speckled. Um, and if you are following along with the discounts, in the pigskin party, I do have um, the coupon code pigskinparty17, which gives you 15% off any of your orders in my shop through the whole pigskin party. Um, and you can use it for this as well. These are gonna be dyed to order. Um, I'm gonna ship them out like as soon as I can. I'm aiming for like two to three weeks on those. Um, I may have put three to four weeks in the listing just to be safe, but I'm trying to get these out as quickly as possible. So anyway, that is now up in the shop. Um, I think I already mentioned earlier that the barber shop, the barber pole, <laughs> barber shop, the barber pole fiber club shipment is going out tomorrow. Um, it's the final shipment for this club. So that's been our three months. I hope you guys love this third one. The third one is very different than the first two. So I hope you enjoy this. Um, and lastly, I'm planning to do a shop update next Friday, which is October 6th, and that will be at 6 p.m. There are still goodies left from the last update. There's still some Halloween colors in there, um, still some of the new semi-solid colors, um, lots of those left if you missed out on those last week, so check those out. Um, yeah, so I... I'm not 100% sure what I'm going to be putting in the shop next week. I do want to put that fiber. Remember I told you about the fiber, the luxury fibers. I'm hoping to get those dyed up to put in the shop next week. And then I think I'm going to try to do some sock blanks because I have a new way I'm dyeing sock blanks um, that I just did some for a wholesale order I delivered this past week. Um, I'd like to put some of those in the shop too. So I know those are things gonna, that are going to be in the shop. Um, but yeah. I, ne whenever I record next week, I'll be able to tell you exactly what's going to be in the update. But just the heads up, that's when the next update will be. Okay, that's everything I've got for you this week. Um, I hope you have a really good rest of your week, which is just today because it's the weekend. So have a good weekend and I will talk to you next week. Bye.